that's all. Thanks so much. Um, we're a couple minutes after the hour, so I think we'll get started if that's okay with you. So I, I know all of you, um, and, and I'm really excited to hear what you guys have been up to. Um, but I'm going to have each of you introduce yourselves, um, the organization that you've worked with, your connection to UMKC, um, and, and then we'll dive into some other questions. I'm going to go from, from how long I've known people. So Juliana, I think I've known you the longest, so we'll start I'm with the you. Oldest. Did you just call me out on being the oldest? No, no, no. I said I've known you the longest. That's a big, huge difference. <laughs> we'll take it. It's okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Yuliana. Um, I go by Yuli. Um, I am a BS in accounting from UMKC 2015, and I work as an associate for McKinsey and Company. Fabulous. Um, and then Macy, how about you? Yeah. Hi, guys. I am currently a technology risk consultant. Risk consultant at RSM, which is a public accounting firm. I worked with Tess when I first got to UMKC in 2015, and I graduated uh, with my accounting degree in 2019 from UMKC. Very good. And Brian? Hey everyone, I'm Brian. Uh, I went to UMKC. I, I did the Accelerated MBA program in 2017, and I'm now at Accenture, and I'm a man management consultant there. So, how did you guys decide on consulting? I actually, I got, I got interested in it actually at UMKC um, during the MBA program where we did a lot of business cases with local KC companies. And just in doing that, you were essentially doing some consulting. And I really thought that was pretty neat. And I really enjoyed finding solutions to their real life problems. And so, that's what kind of spurred my interest. And then from there, I, I started to pursue, uh, how can I get into consulting? So that's kind of where I started with UMKC. Yeah, so after undergrad, I actually worked in DC in international development. So very different to consulting. Um, and then I started to realize that my function and background was just so limited and I loved what I did. Um, but I wanted more exposure. I wanted to work on different problems and consulting offers you that. Um, so when I went to grad school, that was kind of the goal to get into consulting. Um, and it's been amazing. I mean, I'm sure we'll get into it, but in consulting, you can get your hands on so many different projects. Um, it's a constant change of pace and I really like it. Yeah, I got into consulting. I was doing an audit internship with RSM. I knew I loved the firm. And I could do audit for a while, but I knew it wasn't my forever kind of career. So I just expressed interest in consulting to my recruiter. She hooked me up with the right people and I ended up liking it better. So that's kind of how I got into it. So each of you is in a slightly different type of consulting. And, and I think, you know, consulting is one of those things we, the word gets bantied around a bit and everybody sort of knows it's a good career. Um, but I think there's a lot of undergrad students specifically who don't really know what consulting is and what consultants do. So can each of you talk about the type of work that you get involved with, with, with the consulting companies that you work with? And maybe let's start with Brian. Okay. Um, so I'm actually in our pharma and R&D practice. So just as like kind of a background, Accenture is a 500,000 person Company, so we're huge, and we work in basically every industry you could think of. But uh, for my work in particular, I'm focused on uh, pharmaceutical companies, and medical device companies, things of that nature. And my projects will range uh, um, from like a month to a year or more, depending on the scope of that project. And what I'll do in that project is work directly with the client. So usually director level um, folks within the client, and kind of get to understand the problems that they're facing in their business and then kind of do some work to identify ways that we can help them to improve their, their, uh, their business problem. And, and it's kind of, that's how it works. So it's a lot of meetings with clients, a lot of interaction, which I like a lot. Um, you're, with pre-COVID, you're a lot of face-to-face -face meetings, um, but, uh, and then kind of doing that business problem solving process, um, but with, with a focus on, on pharmaceuticals and, and uh, biological uh, processes. And and Macy, how about you with uh, the work that you do in risk? 
Yeah, so we have a couple different groups within even risk consulting at RSM it is such a big firm um, as well. But so with my specific job, I'm working a lot with banks and we kind of come in before the regulators come in for those banks. We make sure like we test different IT controls. So we're looking at things like the new hire process, the termination process with access to the network, like who can change things? Are people being removed so they can't sign back on and you know commit fraud, that kind of thing. So we're looking at those more technical controls. So my work is technically internal audit. And then we release a report stating like our findings and what they should fix. So then they, they can give that to their examiners of like, these are the things that we're working on. Um, but it's also, so my projects typically last from two weeks to three months. We do have some like longer projects and my team does work on some like more like SOC reports which are a little different, but still like within the technical um, field. So we work more so with those like IT controls, which is a little different. And Julie, how about you with McKinsey? Um, I feel like, so McKinsey has its hands everywhere. Um, I have been with the firm for about seven months now and my projects have been so varied, um, but generally McKinsey, so we're an international management consulting firm um, and there are lots of practices that we participate in. There are lots of functions. Um, and as a consultant at McKinsey, um, once you do a certain number of projects, most people align to either a practice or a function. Um, so we have pharma, we have risk. Um, I still haven't decided what I'm aligning to, but I have done a lot of really interesting projects. So um, I worked on a workforce development model for a food bank. I have worked on a due diligence before. Um, my last project was actually with aerospace um, and now I'm working uh, for a hospital. So it's been, it's been a very interesting journey, one that I've really enjoyed. Um, I never thought that as an accountant, I would be learning about bombs, but here we are. Um, overall, yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed my time. So, you know, I know I hear from students all the time, why would an, an, a, a consulting company hire me? I'm not an expert on aerospace. I, I'm, I'm not a, an expert on security and risk for banks. I'm not an expert on, on the pharma industry. So why, wouldn't a, why would a consulting firm hire somebody directly out of school, whether from an undergraduate program or directly from an MBA program. Um, and, and what would you say to that student? I can take this one if you want me to. Um, I think there, so consulting is such a catch-all term and there are many different types of firms that hire. Um, so there are firms more like Accenture and McKinsey that are very generalist, right? Um, and then there's also more specialized firms um, I forget the name, but there, there's a few very economic specific consulting firms, you know, you hire them for their knowledge and they will hire you for your knowledge, you know, um, they will be looking for economists or people with expertise in the field that they're working in. Um, for firms like McKenzie, um, they're looking more for, I mean, I can tell you all about the it, recruiting process, it's hilarious, but they're basically looking for whether you're smart, um, because everything else they can teach you. And it's very, um, the work we do um, relies heavily on experts from outside or inside the organization who are not us. So I'm a generalist, but I, if I'm working in aerospace, I'll be working closely with experts in that field um, to understand what's going on. And the firm has so many resources. So you don't necessarily have to have the background in what the project is, but you just need to know how to utilize your resources. Yeah, I definitely agree with Yuli. They, we're looking for minds to mold. Like, that's what my boss wants you to come in with like an open mind and an empty slate. He can teach you all of the technical things, but like he just needs you to have like an open mind. He wants to like expose me to all different kinds of audits and areas so I can figure out what I am interested in, which is what's really flexible and nice. And having like an accounting background, you can do so much with accounting and having like a banking industry knowledge. I mean, we work with like university, we have a university audit right now, so it can be anything, but um, yeah, I would say just come in with an open mind. Um, so one of the, the 
major aspects of consulting, which perhaps you haven't all experienced it quite as much with COVID, is the travel. Um, have you have you had experience with the uh, with traveling to clients and and what's that like? Um, sort of a, a lifestyle and impact on personal life. I can speak to that. I because I started with Accenture. Um, December 2019. So I had about two months there, like after like February, January, February 2020, where I was traveling actively before COVID started. Um, and I was on a couple of different projects at that period of time. So I can talk to you how it was for a, a couple of different projects. One was, I, I'm now in Philadelphia, and one was in Princeton, New Jersey. So I would go every week and I'd rent a car and drive up there. I'd stay in a hotel, but you could stay at some nice hotels, which is really nice, um, and build some points. So that was pretty nice. And I would go to the client site every day, work with my client counterparts, do some work on their site, enjoy their cafeteria, which was nice. Um, and, and that was kind of uh, the weekly uh, schedule. So I would drive up on a Monday, drive back on Thursday. Um, and it was pretty manageable. You'd see your coworkers there. And then I also had some projects where I would fly. So I flew to Chicago, um, and that was once every other week. And then I also uh, did a road trip down to DC um, for uh, a client workshop that I was hosting. And that was just kind of a three day project. So it can really vary a lot, I think with consulting, but um, you should be ready to, if you, if you like to travel, I think it's a really great opportunity to do so. And you can really see a lot of cool places and, and, and experience some, some cool things. There's always time for you to uh, see the city that you're in if you make time for it. So that's really nice as well. So I really enjoyed it while it lasted and now with COVID, we don't have it uh, at all right now, but uh, I think as soon as things get a little better, we will begin to travel again. So it's still going to be a part of it. Maybe not as big as it used to be, but still, uh, I think it's a pretty cool part of the job. Yeah, I haven't traveled during COVID. Um, we just got a note release that in June will be more of a hybrid. And then depending on like vaccines and what clients request from us will be kind of like what our schedule will be. Um, but yeah, they're definitely enjoying the profits now, not having to pay travel expenses for us, <laughs> I think. So it'll be a lot less travel, I think, in the future. Yeah, and I started during COVID, so I have nothing to contribute to this question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a, a nephew who's a consultant for BCG, and he's loving COVID because in, in the two years prior, it was pretty much leave Sunday night, Monday morning, every week, come home Thursday night, every week. Um, so, so the idea of, of taking a break from that has been a good thing for him. Although I think now he's kind of itching a little bit to get back out there a little bit more. So, um, so, um, COVID definitely has changed things for, for consulting um, since it's become much more virtual than it had been. Um, what are some other trends that you think are, are facing some of the consulting companies maybe post COVID or in the next few years um, that it will impact how you do your work or how your organizations do their work? I think there's a few things. So first, McKinsey is definitely diversifying. So um, it's not a, they're not doing horizontal integration. We're not buying other consulting firms, but we're definitely buying design shops and we're buying more forward thinking agencies to help what is a very old organization stay on top of the trends. So we have a digital arm, we have a design arm, we have a, uh, people who actually make presentations for us, which is a huge time saver. Um, so I think that's one point of it. Um, and so I think there are many different ways to work in consulting that are not necessarily consulting specific. Um, and then the second thing I would say um, relates to um, remote working, um, at least for McKenzie, it used to be that, you know, you were tied to a specific office uh, which doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do projects within that city. Um, you can do projects with any partner in any part of the world, um, but you kind of, they wanted you to live in that city. Now, I think it's going to become a lot more of, um, of a global model to where you are tied to a company, but they don't necessarily expect you to be in any certain particular place. So 
us since we travel all the time. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I would say it's, it's affected our clients more than it's really affected our firm. Our firm's really just been affected by working remote, but our clients have had to come up with a, so one of the areas that we audit is business continuity and disaster plans. So our clients have had to come up with a whole like specific for pandemic, their plans of how they're going to protect their privacy, who has remote access to like what employees have remote access to the network, that kind of thing. So they've really had to nail down their security with everyone being at home or, you know, and split home and, and in the banks, that kind of thing. So I think it's more so affected our clients, but we definitely still have as much work as we had before, which is and maybe more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the, this generation, your, your generation largely, not, not my own, um, is, you know, I think, I think the idea of having value and, and making an impact in your community or in the world is, is something everybody wants in a, a career. But this is a generation that's really insisting upon it. How do you feel that, that what you're doing within your organizations, in your roles, actually fulfills that, that need for you personally to, to have an impact on your community or the world? I can start. Um, my last project, I was working on uh, a software system that was uh, helping one of the pharmaceutical companies develop the COVID vaccine. Um, and so it was helping them better manage their clinical trial data that they were getting from the vaccine um, so they could give it to the FDA to get it approved in a rapid fashion. So it really felt good to know I was a part, some part of that process, not making the vaccine or anything, but just being a part of that process. It felt meaningful, and I, I enjoy knowing that if I'm on a project, that I'm I'm having some sort of impact by helping the company that I'm I'm working with um, achieve uh, an impact. And that one was was really good, I think, and I think recently. Fabulous, and I personally want to thank you for your work on that. As <laughs> I'm I'm facing my second dose this week, so thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's awesome that Brian had that kind of impact. I don't know that my work specifically, but I think it has a huge like world impact. I would say my firm more so has an impact. We are very like into giving back. So the Kansas City office, at least we give back to Big Brothers Big Sisters every year. We had like a big check. Um, well, it was virtual, but a check presentation to them, which was really fun to be a part of. Um, we did like some little competitions to raise money. So I feel like, and with all of our RSM offices doing that same thing, I feel like together we've made a pretty big world impact. Um, with Big Brothers Big Sisters, during Christmas time, we gave back by adopting families. I think we helped eight, seven or eight families with their Christmas. We wrapped, I helped wrap gifts in the office. So that's the kind of things that are, they seem little during the time, but overall they make a bigger impact. Sounds like amazing impact. Um... Yeah, I guess to add to that, um, so like I mentioned, right, McKenzie's an older firm that has been around for ages. And um, what we are trying to do, I think our generation coming in as consultants has definitely shifted McKenzie's thinking about who we are and what we do. Um, first, we're very focused on our people. So, you know, our mission is twofold. It is not only serving the client's and helping them get better, but it's also watching out for our own people. So there are lots of programs involving mental health, involving parental leave um, that I think Mackenzie is doing for its own people. Um, on the side of impact, we've also um, have started a lot of different initiatives. So there is a whole um, case of pro bono studies that we do. We have um, lists of 10 commandments that we're following for racial equality um, and the projects we do on pro bono align with those. Um, we also do um, adjusted pricing for um, foundational projects. So anything, you know, that Bill Melinda Gates Foundation pays for is at, at cost basically for McKenzie. Um, um, we, we basically, I think McKenzie has definitely worked a lot to focus on its social impact sector. And it's grown a lot in the recent years. 
um, there is a whole other practice now that is social impact and public sector, which I'm trying to get into. We'll see. Um, but but I, I think I think the work has just started, and I think it's definitely going to continue. So consulting is tough to get into, as, as I think probably you all know. Um, so what would be some advice that a student coming from UMKC, either as an undergraduate or, an, or a graduate student, what would be some advice that you would have on, on how to get into consulting um, and and then transition through. And I, I know, um, you know, several of you have had several different positions. Juliana, you had gone to grad school elsewhere, but um, knowing what you know from your own company's perspective and be brutally honest on this. And, and most of your companies don't recruit directly from UMKC for their consulting position. So what would be your best advice to students to, to get where you are? I think that's a hard one. I can go ahead and start. Um, so my, whenever I wanted to consult team, it was gonna be my third or fourth internship. So my boss really liked that I had some experience already and I did do like a banking internship. I had some other like experience behind my belt. So he liked that I had, I was coming in already with some of that knowledge. Um, so also Nicole had put something in the chat about um, switching careers you know, getting into consulting that way, I would say having that experience and finding a, finding a consulting role that kind of fits with what you already have makes it a really easy transition. And it's a lot easier to sell yourself on that type of role. Um, but I know our firm, I can speak to our firm specifically, we have 70 new hires across the U.S. just in my like technology, technology risk consulting role being hired in the summer. So we're definitely still looking for people all the time, all cities across the U.S. I would say just keep an eye out, like find, doing that research and finding the firms that you want to work for and just stalking their website, keep refreshing, keep seeing when they post things, follow recruiters from those um, companies on LinkedIn, reach out to alumni that are in consulting, just doing like that LinkedIn research, I think is a really good tool as well. I would, Brian? I would agree. Um, and I, I, I also saw the uh, Nicole's comment in the chat and I can speak from experience on that. Uh, my background was actually in biomedical engineering um, before I, I went to UMKC and, that, and my MBA at UMKC was kind of me trying to pivot into more of a business focus. And I think that the combination of the two was really what helped me get into Accenture, um, kind of using my background, my knowledge and, and also my business knowledge as well to, uh, to sell myself to the company. Um, because like you mentioned, they always, sometimes they, they get into looking at certain universities and they want to recruit from certain places, but I think that they're still open to recruiting uh, individuals who are smart, capable and have experience and, and, and knowledge or the ability to, to learn. So I would also add um, for uh, firms like Accenture and McKinsey, you'll want to kind of familiarize yourself with the interview process because there are case studies, which are a bit different than a lot of traditional interviews that you might be prepping for. So what I did was I just did some research online and there's a lot of great materials there where you can practice um, just learning how they'll ask questions and, and how you should be thinking through the, the, the problems. But it's a little different than, than usual. So I'd say if you are able to get in an interview with one of these companies, it would really be great to practice that a little bit beforehand just to make sure you really ace it. Um, I would say practice it a lot, babe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yes. a lot, yeah. Um, yeah, no, case interviews are a killer depending on who gives it to you. I mean, they're wonderful and exciting and I really enjoyed them, but they're a different way of interviewing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, being honest, um, McKenzie, yeah, McKenzie very rarely looks at non-Ivy League schools and it is unfortunate and to be quite honest, they're missing out on so many wonderful individuals that they could otherwise capture, but it's just so much easier because it's a proven pool, right? So if 
I were to give advice, there are a few number, there are a number of ways to get into McKinsey. If you want to be, you know, there are obviously the functions that I've mentioned that are being purchased. Um, so there's a lot of ancillary services to consulting um, that are a way into McKinsey. Um, but then also, if you want to be properly in consulting, um, you can either get in as a generalist or an expert. Um, so as an expert, I think someone mentioned this in the chat, but those are the people that have 10 plus years of experience who come in and they're um, content leaders on the study. So they're the people that I go talk to. Not if, when, I don't know what's going on. Um, and then um, for the generalist role, I would say we generally hire with a grad degree. So it is either a um, mostly MBA, but it could be a lot of different things or a PhD. <laughs> I know I just threw that out there. Um, but I think I think there's still a number of ways to get in. And I would say that in school, I like if you are in a grad program right now or if you're an undergrad right now, I would focus on developing your leadership experience, something you can truly speak to, something that you did with a team um, or by yourself, um, something that was impactful. Um, I would focus on projects. I would focus on project management, organizations, anything you can get your hands on. Um, and I would focus on creating those connections. Um, most likely, there are people in the organizations that you're looking at who are coming from your organization or from your university. And if you just LinkedIn stalk them um, and reach out, I mean, you will get one out of 10 responses, but the one that you get might actually help you. Um, but it's hard, but it's not impossible. Um, and if anyone wants to talk, I'm open. Yeah. I will say, um, in having worked with some consulting firms over the years, they're, they're looking for people who are really engaged. And, and I know that all of you guys have been. Um, you know, Macy was saying that she'd done three internships and, and Brian had been involved in, in case opportunities um, within the MBA program. And, and Juliana, I mean, you, were, you were involved in everything. You were in an act as you were in. Um, you um, had internships, you had work experience. Um, so, so they are looking for people who, who are out there and really, really getting engaged in the experience and, and maintaining good grades. Um, it's, that's one of the first things I look at too. So, um, so, you know, a lot of people get into consulting, but don't stay in consulting. Um, so, so what about you guys? Are you thinking you're going to stay with the consulting? Are you thinking that, that at some point you'll, you'll make a pivot and, and how would you make that decision then? I don't think I've decided yet, um, but McKinsey's attrition rate is pretty high. Um, most people, so the way it works, right? You either come in after an undergrad as an analyst or you come in after an MBA, PhD, et cetera, um, as an associate. So I'm an associate. And then after about a year and a half to two years, you become an engagement manager, which is the person who oversees the actual project. Um, and a lot of people leave at that stage. Uh, because it gives you enough credibility that you can do the job without becoming too specialized in whatever practice you're tied to. Um, I think that happens for a number of reasons. I think a lot of people use consulting as a path forward. I mean, having a consulting firm on your resume is going to make you a manager, director, whatever, after you leave, right? And for a lot of people, that's just a very easy way to skip like five different steps in their career. Um, but I would also say the consulting hours are really long um, and you have to adjust your life to the expectations and it can be very difficult. And for a lot of people, they burn out. Um, so for me, I would say, I think I want to stay at least for now, depending on what practice I align to. My goal is to split my time between consumer practice or yes, consumer practice um, and public sector. Um, Again, I feel like with McKenzie, you kind of, we'll see, ask me again in two years, um, but I am really enjoying my time right now. Yeah, I can go next. Uh, I do plan on staying um, when I decided, so I, I always knew I was a non-traditional accounting student, and that's honestly part of why I chose consulting also, um, was that I, I didn't know if I would want to do my CPA, and that is one of the things that 
at RSM, I can be a partner, not a, or I can be a principal, not a partner, not having my CPA. So I do plan on getting other um, more IT related certifications. So that is another thing is the public accounting firms, they will pay for you to get certifications. And that does help, um, you know, just your industry knowledge and, and all of that. So I do plan on staying with the firm for a long time, hopefully forever. But I do know that like, having an open mind, I'm open to anything that comes my way. And if anything sounds better, then I'll definitely consider it. But right now, I think that this is a super great career. I, I can finish up. I, I, I think that what both uh, Macy and Yuli have said uh, is with me as well. Um, and what I've seen within Accenture is that a lot of managers that I've kind of been networking with are, are no. Some of them have gone already and they've gone to clients or uh, other companies in, in the industry that we work in, in pharma usually. Um, and they're, they're moving up to a director or, or a VP role or something like that. So I think people usually like to do at least three, three years or, or more um, and depending on, on where your career takes you. But I think consulting is a really great means to an end if that's what you're looking for. But I've also seen people who have stuck around and you can really grow your career in consulting as well. And it's not all the travel, although when you start, you will be doing a lot of the grind and a lot of travel. Um, if you can put up with it for a couple of years, you'll be at, once you make manager or something like that, you're able to go a little bit more, have some more time at home and things like that. So I'm definitely planning on staying for a little bit longer. I really am enjoying my time here and I'm learning a lot. I'm getting a lot more experiences. And so I want to kind of grow my career a little bit more here and and then assess where I want to go. And uh, I, I saw another chat question that was directed at me specifically. I just wanted to call it out, Nicole. Um, I noticed you mentioned um, that you were looking specifically for pharma R&D um, consulting positions and that they require experience in the field. And I think that is definitely true. One theme that I have noticed with my colleagues and myself is a lot of us all tend to have biomedical engineering degrees for some reason. Um, that's something that they hire a lot of. Um, I know it might be too late now to go back and do that, but actually one of my good friends, he got his master's in biomedical engineering. He was a business major before. So if you're really interested in it, uh, that, that's that's one route. But I think another way could be to, uh, and I, I didn't say this, but I also worked at Cerner out right after UMKC for about a year. And that that experience was valued by Accenture as well. So I think you can kind of look to, pick up experience that is kind of fringe related to pharma. Like for instance, with Cerner, I was working with hospital systems, uh, medical medical uh, billing and things of that nature. So it was related to you know the pharma industry in some way. And if you can find something like that that's related, it doesn't have to necessarily be working for a pharmaceutical company, but something like that will really help out a lot, I think, with looking for a position like that. And uh, I think that's kind of the best route you can take. Um, I think it's um, <laughs> excuse me. I think it's it's interesting, especially Brian and Yuli, the the paths that you took to where you're getting from from where you what you studied as an undergraduate, what you did for work experience, you know, then then your graduate school programs. Um, can you can you speak at all about that as how that? <laughs> sorry, I'm going to cough in a second, but how that's impacted your success in getting the consulting role? Hold up. Um, Sorry about you, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just got a tickle in my throat. So no, it's not COVID. <laughs> I always feel I have to clarify these days. But. Um, so would you like us to walk through yeah. our career path? Yeah, or if you if you wouldn't mind, because I think that that especially for, for you two, your career path really probably was an interesting one for the consulting companies that you are now with. Uh, I'm a non-traditional hire, I think, in every single job that I've ever had. Um, so I got my degree in accounting from UMKC, and then I really wanted, I'm from Ukraine originally, the war in Ukraine happened, I was like, I'm going to go fight, and my mother was like, I will kill you if you go. So I was like, fine, then I'll work in international development, because, you know, clearly. Um, so I moved to DC, got a job as a staff accountant for a 
agriculture organization. So what we basically did was we helped um, um, countries that were devastated by any sort of natural disaster in the past 10 years, right? We helped them develop their crops back up or provide hunger relief, many different things. Um, and I started in an accounting role, but quickly switched to a more project management role. So I was buying like these huge mango grading machines from Pakistan. I was buying like milk making machines from for Ethiopia, like weird stuff. Um, then I switched to, um, and I loved it, but I wasn't necessarily getting that full project management experience. So then I switched to global financial support for McKenzie Social Initiative, which is um, now called Generation. And uh, Generation basically does international workforce development. There are a lot of countries that either A, don't have opportunities for um, people to pursue anything after high school, um, or B, there are just no jobs really available, even if people do finish a university degree, let's say like Spain. So what I did basically there was um, anything that had to do with global organization. Um, and I liked that a lot, um, but it felt very much like I was still seen as the accountant. It was very hard to get away from that well, you have an accounting degree, you're a finance person. And I wanted to be a strategy person. I wanted to be a person that led the projects. My idea for going to get my MBA was very much, I want to eventually go back into the social sector and actually run my own programs or do something on my own, start my own nonprofit, whatever. Um, and so I got my grad degree and I see McKenzie as a twofold. Uh, first, a very great experience to get exposure to many different um, business sides and functions, but also um, to get exposure to the social sector from sort of a bigger company perspective, because I've always been more on a smaller scale. Um, so it's definitely been very not traditional in every single sense of the way. Um, but I think if you articulate your strengths in a right way, I don't think there's I think a lot of skills are very applicable across many different um, many different jobs. So it wasn't very difficult. Um, okay, uh, so from from mine, I, I started uh, biomedical engineering with my undergraduate degree. And from there, I kind of took the traditional path and I, I, I got hired by a pharma company in Kansas City. And I was a bioprocess engineer for about a year and a half. And that was kind of just straight up engineering work focused on uh, producing vaccines and, and, and working in the lab. And I enjoyed that. It was, it was pretty technical and I got to get my hands on, you know, the, the, the process. But at the same time, I really wanted to learn more about the business side. And I saw, you know, the sales folks that come, came through the lab and, and talked with our, our leadership. And, and, and I really wanted to get more involved in that process, which is what led me to UMKC where I, I then got my MBA. Um, and from there, you know, I, I kind of spoke to it before, but I got exposed to more of the business case um, development and, and the consulting world. And, and that's what I really locked my eyes on and I really wanted it. And I really wanted to be a management consultant in particular, which is kind of like Accenture, McKinsey type firms, but it was not easy to get into. And I tried and I tried and it wasn't, I, I wasn't able to right away. And so what I did was I, I went to Cerner first to pick up some initial consulting experience. And Cerner is a great place, especially if you're UMKC, they, they love to hire UMKC grads. And it's a great, I would say it's a great start to consulting because um, you can get in there and really get a lot of great consulting experience. You'll be able to travel, work with clients directly. And that's what I did. And I tried to get as much, as much exposure as possible there. And, and, and after a year at Cerner, I, I was able to uh, get that interview with Accenture and it all went well. And now I leveraged basically everything that I had done at that point to get my position at Accenture. So, you know, I took the consulting experience from Cerner, my MBA for my business knowledge, and then my background in biomedical engineering to kind of establish that I was familiar with the pharma industry and I'd worked in it before. And so I think that combination of things really helped me. And I, I really targeted it though because I, I did look for like the generalist positions and kind of overall, but it was really difficult for me to crack in. Um, just that they were just looking for a certain profile, you know, an Ivy League or something like that. But when I came with a targeted approach and I, I specifically looked for the pharma R&D uh, consulting position and that I think that and really crafting my case and my story when I was going into interviews and 
putting together my resume really is what helped me get to where I am now. And that was through kind of talking with the, the uh, support staff at UMKC, you know, Tess, I had a lot of t- talks with her and, and, all, and Maggie and all the great folks there, kind of getting some more insights and, and learning how to craft my story and get to where I wanted to be. So I think that's how I kind of did my journey. Um, but I think if you just look at where you've been and where you want to be, just look at the pieces of what you've accomplished so far and how they could contribute to where you want to go and use that to, to your advantage. So outside of case interviewing, what are some of the things that, that the firms that you, have, you, that you work for are looking for in the, in the process, when they're reviewing resumes, when they're, when they're interviewing, what are the, the traits, the qualities that, that are important? I would say soft skills are very important. Like you need to be able to um, speak to clients, especially if you're client facing, which most consultants are. Um, Even you won't be leading meetings right out of the gate, but like eventually you will be leading the meetings, getting to know the client. Email communication is huge. So taking like those management classes where they prep you for that seriously will will really help you. Um, I would say they're also looking for. like just being a team player, being able to get done with your work or handle your specific um, tasks, but also be able to like ask for help, ask questions, um, take some work. If you finish work early, take some work off of your teammates, like just being a helpful person and being a good person and looking to learn are like really big when you first start. I definitely agree. And I think um, the soft skills are definitely a big part of it because aside from the case interviews, they do still perform the regular interviews and they'll ask you some tough questions and just want you to be able to really speak to your experience and and sell yourself. I think going into the interview and and thinking, you know, I'm really made for this role and be able to communicate that in a good way, um, that will really help. Um, And then also with your resume, trying to establish anything you've done leadership wise, things that you've been able to take command on, that's really powerful um, when they're looking at your resume. Well, um, I think Macy and Brian have covered most things, but yeah, I guess for consulting, they're mainly looking for a self-starter who can solve problems. And yeah, you're not going to do it on your own. There is a team, but at least at McKenzie, you own your work stream. And so you need to know where you're going and work backwards to make sure everything is to plan. So you definitely have to be a self-starter. You definitely have to be a team player. Um, You have to have analytical skills, um, conceptual problem solving, but those are all things that are generally teachable on the job. The reason they do case interviews is because it's a, at least at McKenzie, I don't know how they did it at Accenture, but it's a dumbed down version of a actual study that we worked on. Mm -hmm. So they'll be like, well, a trucking company called dump trucks, you know, but we actually worked with them, but you know. Um, and it, it is there to test how you think. It is there to test your analytical skills. Um, they make you do math without a calculator, which is really, really silly, but it's supposed to show how you can think on the spot, but also how you do under pressure because you will mess up. Um, and so, but yeah, I would say, I would say generally, if you're interested in consulting and they do case interviews, definitely prep for them. Um, because they're quite something. So case interviewing is, is sort of a cornerstone of consulting interviewing. Um, and so a lot of firms use it. What are some resources that you would recommend for students to practice to get some exposure to case interviewing? Did you use any, any of the tools out there? Um. I, I Googled and there was some forum and I don't remember the name of it now, but it, it was all about getting into the top five consulting companies. That was the dedic- the forum was dedicated to that. And they had a lot of, of case samples, case interviews. And actually McKinsey actually has a website that has case interviews with answers. So you can kind of get an idea of what a good answer might be just so you can kind of look through and see what the thought process is you might want to go through when you're considering them. And I used that as well when I was prepping, and that really helped out a lot. Um, 
And I think a lot of the other, like I think Bain also has it. Um, so if you Google and you start to look around, you can find some really great resources as you prep and then start to do them just yourself and just do one without answers and start to answer it and see how you did and time yourself and things like that. Um, I think that's a really great way to start. Um, I'm sure they have courses, but I didn't really feel like paying for it. <laughs> Um, but uh, you can find a lot online, just, just Googling. I think that's the best route. I think I got lucky because my business school had like a whole consulting club with leaders who sat there with you and you were like, you're an idiot, like this is how you do it. Um, but I would say if you're doing it on your own, um, I would honestly YouTube it first, see what it actually is. Understand, and I know that our business school has definitely put out a few really good videos out there of people actually doing casing. So I would look at it first, understand what you're up against. Um, then I would absolutely look at online resources. But then also there are a lot of books that are not that expensive. I think the one that everyone loves is called Casing Point. Um, and if it wasn't as helpful to me because again, we had a consulting club, they'd already taught us all of that. But if you are starting from scratch, it's an amazing, amazing um, booklet, booklet book. Um, I would also say that I would just watch out. Every single firm has a bit of their own case interview style. Um, so I'm not quite certain about Accenture, but with McKenzie, it's very interviewer led. Um, but then Bain and BCG are a lot more like, where should we go next? Um, and you have to, be prepared for that because you want to you want to make sure that you are driving the case in the way they want you to because that's also going to be a big part of the review process. Um, I would also say, Tess, I'm not sure if you're interested in this, but I have a lot of case books with like cases that we studied in business school. If you want to, I can share and then maybe you can give it to students if they're interested. Oh, that'd be fantastic. Really, really fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, I think that with, with you know, not that I, I would ever recommend that a student go into any type of interview and just figure I'm going to wing it. Never go into a case interview thinking, ah, well, I'm pretty good at interviewing. I'll be fine. <laughs> um, prep ahead of time. So what would be your, your best advice? You know, we're, we're coming down to the, to the end of our hour here. So what would be your best advice for students um, who are thinking, well, this all sounds kind of interesting um, to, to get started on a path in consulting? That's a hard one. Um, I would say just go into every experience you have with an open mind. If it's not exactly everything you want to do, like right that now, it, it could be eventually, but like just take that experience with what it is and just give it your all because you're going to get something from it and you're only going to get out of it what you put into it. So I just, I have always gone into my experiences with an open mind, um, taking whatever I can learn from the experience. If you try something and don't like it, that's okay. There's a million and 10 other things that you can do. Or if you are really excited about consulting and it doesn't work out, maybe it's just the firm, you know, like I would say just go into each experience with an open mind, um, ready to learn and give it your all. Um, and that's really all you can do. And if you need to pivot, pivot. If you, um, you know, network with people that are two levels above you, network, network with people that are, you know, partners. I've talked to some women partners at the firm and they've given great advice. Um, I've also talked with just my team about either struggles I'm having or, you know, they're really good about checking in too, but just like be vocal about if you're, you know, during these times working from home or starting your career from home and you're not happy, you know, reach out to someone and just say, let's grab coffee or I need to get out of here. I'm feeling stir crazy or, you know, reach out to people and just have that strong communication because people can't read your mind. If you don't like the work you're doing, they hired you for a reason. They want you at the firm and they'll find another place for you whether that's on a different consulting team or whether that's in, you know, you are an accountant, you want to switch to audit, just be open with like what you want and where you want to go and people will help you get there. That was a really good point. <laughs> I was, I was going to say something to, to that same note. Um, networking, using the con connections you can form now um, can be really helpful and not being afraid to reach out to people on LinkedIn. I've had 
I think five people messaged me on LinkedIn. I've talked to every single one of them about Accenture and, you know, gotten to know them a little bit and I've actually recommended one of them. Um, so I, I think if you, you, you really want to get into it, that's a good way. If you don't know anyone specifically in your circles that is involved, you can still look online, look on LinkedIn, um, and then just be vocal about it because somebody might know a resource you could reach out to. If you, if you say, I'm really interested in consulting and you tell your professors, tell others, they, uh, you know, um, your career counselor, um, they can help you to, to achieve that as well. Yeah, I would agree. Can we get in? I think it worked. <laughs> it's only been a year with Zoom all the time. You'd think I'd remember to unmute myself every once in a while. But, um, <laughs> Um, anything, anything else you feel we haven't asked that students should know? Uh, I, I don't want to leave Nicole hanging. I see she has, has one other question about uh, an aspect of consulting that really challenged me. And I'd say that it was one, certain projects, and I think it depends on clients and what they want, but some projects can be a lot more intense than others. Um, and so there are some where they'll really ask a lot of you. And so you have to be ready to travel a lot and spend long days at the client site. And um, it can be a little intense. Um, so that was a bit challenging for me coming from usually working, you know, eight hour day, not more than that and kind of going home and stuff and then transitioning to a project that was pretty intense, working some 12 hour days sometimes um, or more and just really having to put, put it all on the line. But ultimately, it is worth it and people will notice you putting your all into it and it will reward, that will reward you a lot. So it's not all like that, at least from my perspective, but there are times where it can get kind of intense a little bit more than you might be used to, but um, that's something that was a bit different for me when I went into it. Yeah, I would say the biggest challenge for me is probably just like the technical, just vocabulary that my team uses. I wasn't there quite yet. Um, I'm still not. And I would say just going in, knowing that there will be challenges, there will be like learning curves that you'll have to like hurdle. But I would say just being genuinely curious and wanting to learn those things and not letting it get you down or make you feel dumb and you know, whatever, like you're starting out, they get it, ask questions, they get concerned. Seniors get concerned if you're not asking questions. So just ask the stupid question. Um, and I would say um, on another like, challenge level just working from home and your work-life balance like you do have to be intentional with when you sign on when you signed off when you sign off when you're on your if I'm on my phone for like you know every 30 minutes or something I will stay extra time because I know that I was not giving it my all for the last half of the day or something um we do have busy seasons so at my firm specifically if you're curious like my team and every team is different but my team is specifically busy from September to December, and we work 50-hour weeks. Some weeks it's more if I really need to get something done before the next week. We take the week off of Thanksgiving, so the week before that is really busy. Just trying to wrap up everything so you can have that PTO during, like, the holidays. Um, so just finding a firm that's really flexible. RSM is really great about that, so just doing your research about work-life balance. I think at least our firm is being really understanding and flexible my boss has said multiple times put 30 minutes block 30 minutes on your calendar to get outside today it's a beautiful day just so you don't get meetings and stuff for next week if the weather's nice so yeah you can make it work but just got to be intentional and know what you want yeah i agree i think i think overall just i guess to tie up what you guys said um consulting is it, it, it takes a lot out of you and you have to, like you mentioned, Macy, you have to be very intentional about your work-life balance, whether it's, you know, we do two learnings and I'm like, I need one day a week where I know I can go to dinner, you know, at this time. Um, but at the same time, it's a very rewarding career. And if you figure out how to make it work for yourself, I think it can take you really far. And it's not just about that. It's it's a fascinating career. Like the things I have done in the past six months have been just mind blowing. Um, so it's just all about figuring out how to make it work for you. 
All right. You know, thank you. We're, we're coming up on our, our hour right now. And I just want to thank all of you. I know you guys are busy and I really appreciate this. This is a, a career that we've seen more students want to pursue. Um, and, and I think that, you know, just hearing from you, students who have been at UMKC, who have been successful in, in obtaining these careers, is, it is inspirational and, and really informational. So thank you so, so much. And um, we, we look forward to following your careers and seeing what's next for all of you guys.